Thanks very much for joining us. We're going to get started in a minute or two here. See some people starting to come into the session, so that's good news. Give folks another minute or two to get on and then we'll get started. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to get started in about two minutes. About one more minute and we'll kick things off. All right, let's get started. We've got a great group online. Thanks very much for joining us today. My name is John Nisley. I'm a principal with Fortress IQ, working with companies to use process intelligence to jumpstart and scale their automation and improvement programs. And I also have the pleasure of moderating the conversation today. Given our guests, it promises to be an interesting and lively discussion. Based on the prep session last week, I can ensure that you will leave with at least one piece of knowledge to impress your colleagues and more importantly, help make your organization more resilient and competitive in this new environment that we are navigating. With me today are two industry experts. We've got Caitlin Thomas and Molly Bland from BPMD. The company is the leader in establishing the discipline and that's the D in the name of business process management to really drive value from transformation programs across operational excellence, customer experience, and process innovation. One final housekeeping comment before we jump into the presentation. We really want this session to be helpful for you. So submit any questions, chat in comments to us anytime and we'll do our best to address them. Uh, this session will also be archived and we will provide access to the slides as well. As for the plan today, Caitlin and Molly are going to start us off and give roughly a 20, 25 minute briefing. And that's going to include a live demo of the solution and the findings uh, all around process led transformation where real world data is used to help teams truly examine how their business operates. Uh, then I'll join back in the conversation as we tackle your questions and comments. So thank you again for joining us today. Caitlin and Molly, welcome to the program. Caitlin, do you want to kick off the session? Yep, thanks, John, for, for that introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, we're excited to be here today, and hopefully you're going to learn something new about process transformation and how to fight off uh, process transformation fatigue. Um, so just quickly first, um, I just want to give a brief background on who BPMD are, um, and then we will explain the approach that we take when we're um, tackling um, process improvement initiatives and transformation projects. And then we'll go for a case study uh, specifically for order to cash and Molly will take us through this case study and she'll show you a demonstration of the insights that were found um, on a Power BI dashboard uh, before we wrap up the session at the end. So um, first of all, BPMD, we're, we're a small boutique consultancy and we have offices in the UK, US and Mumbai. 
Our co-CEOs are Matthias Kirchmer and Peter Franz, and they set up the company in 2013 after having a very long career with Accenture. Um, they've got a bunch of papers and books around what we call the BPMD framework, and we base all of our offerings on this. So essentially, we're just big process nerds, and we um, our offerings were all focused around process and process management. Uh, these include setting up process repositories and uh, fostering the, the BPMD, a BPM discipline. Uh, we also look at improving customer excellence through um, customer journey mapping and how you can then relate these journeys to your operational processes. Uh, we also um, have offerings around automation um, and um, how we can um, find the best sections in your processes to automate in order to deliver the most value. Uh, but finally, and what we're going to focus on today is our process improvement and transformation offering. Um, so Process transformation, our main approach, we've, did, we've, we've developed a five step approach uh, which enables organizations to realize the most value from the process intelligence or task mining initiatives. Um, usually this happens while they undergo um, a process improvement and transformation project. So first of all, we have the defined step. Um, this is a vital phase of our approach as it will determine the scope of the project. Um, but it would also start to bring together the people necessary to identify and analyze and then eventually push forward that future change within that process area. Now, we take a process centric view on the area that your organization thinks requires improvement or will ultimately benefit from transformation. We calculate the parts or part or parts of the process, um, which will generate the most value from further evaluation uh, through mining and by discussing the whole end to end rather than just individual processes. Um, we, we cut through and look at the whole end to end uh, through those uh, functional Very barriers, um, which will allow us to identify the key problem areas. Now, this exercise will help us to highlight the upstream activities that might be the root cause of the problems identified through the mining runs, but we can also identify the processes downstream, which might be affected by the bottlenecks that we found through mining. And that's why it's really key to focus in on that end-to-end -end process view. Another key part uh, to the defined step um, is the process interviews. Now, these help us to um, understand the data setup requirements for the investigation, um, such as um, uh, defining start and end screens, defining the applications that we want to be included um, within the analysis, and also defining the fields that we require for extraction. Um, this is really, really vital, otherwise um, the setup isn't done correctly and then you will end up having to redo work um, further down the project. Um, and that's why it's important to set up this at the start and get that they get the interaction um, with the key SMEs. Now, we understand that valuable insights are generated through both people and data. And that in order to see transformation projects through to the end, people within the organization do actually need to take ownership of these initiatives. And this is why, um, what's good is reiterating that we really like to start talking to people from the very start of the project and getting them involved. Now, moving on to the mine phase of the project, with the help of the Fortress IQ team, we extract the data and complete the mining runs. Um, we usually do a test run first just to ensure that the required data is being successfully pulled through on the tool uh, before we then um, fully install the observers um, on the relevant devices. Now, Molly's going to go through this in a bit more detail, but these observers are the devices which will capture the click by click activities of the user on their screen. Once that data has been collected, um, then it just needs uh, very minor bits of cleaning um, and then it could be uploaded to Power BI. Um, and this is where the analysis can start. So um, moving on to the discovery phase, this is um, for our cases where Molly completed um, a deep dive evaluation on the data. Uh, she extracted insights and developed some dashboards that met the client's requirements. Uh, she's going to take you through some of these dashboards in the demonstration shortly. 
And um, once we've got all this collected, we worked out uh, where the issues were. Uh, we looked at the root causes um, and we did this not just through the data insights, but also through those process interviews um, with the people that were carrying out the process at the start. Now, all of this comes together, both the um, insights from the people and the insights from the data um, to and we ended up presenting our findings to the senior leadership team. Now, this was a smaller scale project. However, on larger scale projects, usually what we do in this phase is that we actually schedule in a half day improvement workshop with the team. And this is where the team comes together um, across the end to end process. So they might sit within different departments and different functions, but we bring them all together and we go through our findings, both from the data and from the process interviews. And quite often it, we find that what, what we find in the process interviews, we can back up with the data um, and we discuss those issues and we come up with appropriate improvement actions um, in order to mitigate that in the future. Now, these improvement actions uh, then need to be categorised um, in, in order to help us um, narrow down the kind of the scale of the improvement initiatives and to put them into kind of what we call we call them work packages but some people prefer to call them mini projects um, and they can include process changes organizational changes behavioral changes and automation initiatives um, and then these work packages are prioritized based on an effort and value delivered basis um, so being um, low effort, high value would then be high priority. And then we can um, then place these appropriately into um, a transformation roadmap for the business for that specific process area. Um, what we can also do is that the, um, the improvement actions, so be that the process, behavioral or automation changes, we can simulate these to actually calculate the, um, the cost or time saving benefits from carrying out those initiatives. However, for this particular case study, we didn't do the whole workshop. We just presented our findings and discussed the improvement actions with the senior leadership team. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Molly now, who's gonna take you through this case study um, in a lot more detail um, and also include a demonstration. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so hi, my name is Molly. Um, I'm an analyst at BPMD and I'm going to take you through a transformation project we did with one of our clients. Um, so our client was a small management consultancy with business units in the UK and in India. Uh, and they were having trouble with uh, a slow invoicing process, which led to delays in getting paid by customers. Um, so the client engaged BPMD to dig into the invoicing portion of their order to cash process. Um, by utilizing our rapid process improvement approach um, and Fortress IQ's process intelligence software, BPMD quick, um, well, we quickly uncovered and resolved uh, these process uh, inconsistencies. Um, so firstly, I'll take you through our approach um, to identifying the tasks to focus our improvement on in order to create value for our clients. Um, and then we'll have a look at the outputs of our investigation using um, the Fortress IQ tool. Um, so the issue we identified is that invoices were taking between 15 to 20 days to process. Um, instead of analysing the entire invoice process and getting data on that entire process, potentially wasting time on process areas that may not create value um, or solve the issue at hand, we needed to target our process improvement to a specific high impact area. Um, so we needed to identify the main bottlenecks causing this delay in order to target our improvement efforts maximizing results while minimizing effort and expense. Um, so as Caitlin's already mentioned, we used quick RPI on the order to cash process um, and identified a major issue with timesheet submission. Um, so timesheets were often submitted late and this was causing delays in the processing of invoices. So I'll take you through um, our RPI methods in the next slide. Um, but the process an employee goes through when filling out their timesheet looks something like this. Um, and it occurs entirely in the CMAP Chrome application. Um, as you can see, breaking down the process um, produces both level four and level five processes. Um, 
task mining is a really good approach to analyze processes at this level, um, as opposed to analyzing a high level process like order to cash using process mining, we're using task mining because it offers an opportunity to get a really detailed assessment of a specific task and then define the best improvement method. Um, so the process um, was also ideal for task mining as it occurs in the CMAP application. So the entire process can be logged. Um, so going on to the next slide, our approach to identifying the most effective process area to focus on used quick RPI techniques. Um, so the processing of invoices falls under the order to cash end to end process. Um, and to better understand the process, um, processes within order to cash, uh, we gathered information on this process through interviews with process SMEs. So during this interviews, we focused on two key areas um, to identify processes and activities that could be causing bottlenecks leading to delays in the processing of invoices and uh, to gather information to develop a capability mapping of the end to end process. Here, with the help of the SMEs, we mapped out the maturity and impact levels of all the level three processes within this end to end. Um, as you can see, we identified multiple bottlenecks that could be causing so, uh, delays in invoicing. You can see in the, in the red bubbles here. Um, the, the main finding we had was that there was no standard way of doing these processes across the team. Um, in particular, the adoption of recording timesheets across the team was not adequate. Uh, this often led to late timesheet submissions, which in turn delays the invoicing process. Um, as you can see, the SMEs um, we interviewed identified the recording of time and expenses as having a high impact on the optimize, on optimizing uh, invoice cycle time, and that this process was actually at a very low maturity level. Um, this makes it an ideal candidate for process improvement. So it's clear that ensuring we understand the end-to-end -end process thoroughly and the issues the client is facing was key to gain value from our data. So using our RPI approach, we were able to drill down into the end-to-end -end process and identify the ideal task to begin collecting data on. Um, so we used the Fortress IQ software to collect data on the client's timesheet submission process. Um, over the course of a week, employees used the Neo2 Observer, which Caitlin's already mentioned, to record themselves filling out their timesheet in order to gain insight into the process. So how we did this was they can um, just download this observer onto their computer, they can trigger it and it will observe them doing the task. Um, and this will be saved into the Fortress IQ application as events. So every click, every keystroke they did was saved as an event. So we can actually go and track what they're actually doing when they're filling out their timesheets. We can also look at cycle times, we can look at application usage. I mean, yeah, it's a really cool tool for digging into um, what users are doing when they're doing these, these processes. So after we collected the data, we ran some mining runs to capture the process instances. So we had all the data in a big event log and we did mining runs to try and actually capture different instances of, of a user performing that process. Um, secondly, we would then uh, ex check through the data, validate it, export it. Um, and ensure that it's complete before we start the analysis. We can then upload the data into Power BI and uh, begin that analysis. So that's an overview of our approach to, um, to, to these projects. Um, I can now move on to a quick demo. Hey, Molly, as you uh, switch over to the demo, let me ask just a quick question. You know, how does that timeline, uh, and maybe Caitlin, maybe you can answer this and let, let Molly get switched over. You know, how does that timeline compare with similar projects, you know, similar size projects, similar complexity, similar scope, um, but projects that don't use Fortress IQ? You know, given that your involvement during that data collection process is, is generally passive, yeah, you might need to check in and, and make sure the data is capturing correctly and things like that. You know, is that overall time, you know, similar but requires fewer resource hours or is it both faster and uses fewer resources? Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of resource hours, it's definitely cuts down the resource hours required to do these type of projects when you do start using a mining tool or a process intelligence tool like Fortress IQ. Um, when you're actually collecting the data, it, you do very much just sit back um, and you let the observers run. Depending on the scope of the project, you might decide you want to take two weeks worth of data. You might want to take a month's worth of data. Obviously, that's determined 
in the scope at the start. Um, but no resources are required for that data to be collected. Um, however, when it comes to the mining runs, if you haven't identified specifically the data set up correctly at the start, um, we find that you then kind of have to go back and, and, and you know, meant you know tell the tool that okay we want to pick up this field and this field and this field and I so if you scope out the project correctly at the start it is very few uh, very few resources are actually required and the data setup is very quick and easy and um, if I compare this to um for, to transformation projects where we haven't used data mining tools and this has all been done through process interviews and then modeling up the processes um, manually and then getting together and doing these big workshops um, that is substantially more resource time you need to speak to SMEs not just you know that don't just carry out one specific task but across the whole end-to-end -end process which can cut functions um, and you know it can end up being a rather long um, and it can take months to do that just to, to model up those processes correctly and, and get the right people involved so um, from that perspective Yes, a tool, a mining tool does really, really help to reduce the, the resource time required for these type of projects. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. And it's also it's it's your time as sort of the consultant analyst, but it's also the stakeholder, you know, time that people yeah. don't have to sit through workshops and don't have to document exactly what they do as well. So no, that that's helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Um yeah, so we as Caitlin was just talking about, we only had to collect just over a week's worth of data because it's quite a sm small scale project and we just really wanted to see what um, the users were doing over a course of, of a week. So our users, um, so the client, they submit their timesheets weekly. So, so they have to fill it, they have to fill out their timesheet and submit it every week. Um, and that's what, um, they're meant to be doing in order to make sure that invoices are submitted on time. Um, so what the first thing uh, we found through our interviews with the SME is that some people will fill it out at the, on the Friday. So they'll fill it out at the end of the week and submit their timesheet all in one. And some people will fill it out over the course of the week, save it over the week and then submit it on the Friday. Um, so there are two different ways of doing it. And some people would yeah, people. Some people forgot this is what was causing um, delays in timesheet submissions. Um, but so, I, I first. So once I collected the data and uploaded it into Power BI, I created this overview page. I just wanted to get a few of the data, um, see what's going on. Um, I always do this when I when I start a uh, project and start working with the data, just to give myself a high level view. Um, I'm just going to start off by explaining what an instance is. So when I refer to an instance, it's uh, it means one person going into the application, filling out their timesheet and either saving or submitting. So they go in, they fill it out and they save or submit. That's one user performing the process one time is an instance. Um, and you can see up in the top left corner here, I said number of instances and I said number of full instances. So this means that, so that 34 times someone went into their timesheet, they filled out their timesheet and they either saved or submitted their timesheet. So I've already mentioned some people were doing this daily and some people were doing this weekly. And I wanted to compare, I wanted to say, okay, can I compare how much time someone spends on their timesheet when they fill it out every day and how much time they spend on it when they fill it out weekly. So I needed to combine those daily, um, those daily submissions together so I could compare they're spending per week with those who are submitting weekly and so that's what uh that's what i mean when i say these full instances so we had 13 full instances of a user within um, this company going out and filling out their timesheet um over the course of a week um and so what i did then was i then looked at a sum of all the time they spent doing that so for some people they just did it all in one go and I didn't have to um, kind of concatenate that data, but for the people that were filling it out daily and filling out based on what they did per day, um, instead of waiting till the end of the week, I needed to add together all the time they spent in there per week. And so I did that and this is what I got. I got this interesting table um, down in the bottom left. I don't know if you can see it. Let's see if I can zoom in. Um, a bit. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so I've got this table here and you can see, so this is uh, an instance number. This is one user filling out their timesheet. And then you can see we have the duration. So this is a, a sum of all the time they spent filling out their timesheet in one week. And, the, and you can see it here as, as a bar chart if, it, if that helps people to see it um, more visually. But the first thing I noticed that was interesting is that there's such variation in the time people were spending. And you can see that some people were only spending a few minutes filling out their timesheet. And so I decided to look into this a bit more because I thought that seemed a bit strange um, that some people were taking 40 minutes and that other people were taking two or three minutes. Um, and when I kind of, when I deep dived into that, I found that, so our client had two offices. I've already mentioned they have a UK office and they have a, an India office. And when I, when I looked um, and compared this data, I found that the UK office, so all of these, and I don't want to call them anom anomalies, but these, very, um, these lower uh, durations, these were all occurring in the India office. So I thought I, I split up my investigation into, into office one and office two. Uh, so I can uh, start to dig a bit deeper into the data. And when I did this, I found something quite significant. Um, the first thing I noticed, just wait for it to load, is that in, in the UK office, what was really causing their, their, them spend more time in the application was the fact that the number of times they're having to click into a text field and fill out a text field was significantly higher. So for, for, each, um, for each instance of them filling out their timesheet for that week, they were having to click into the text field a lot, into a text field a lot more. Whereas when you look at office two, for each instance, they're, they're clicking into text fields far fewer times. And so that was the, the, the key thing that was causing this office to spend more time filling out their timesheets. And when, when, you, when we went back to the process of them having to fill out their timesheets, you could see that what you have to do is you have to click into a text field, you have to say how much time you spent on a task, and then you have to click into a notes and then describe what you were doing. Um, and if you look at what we found was that actually the India, in comparison to the UK office, who were working on multiple projects per day, maybe they're spending two hours on one thing, three hours on another thing, you know, half an hour maybe on BD, they were having to fill out, they were having to fill out a lot more rows of their timesheet because they were doing multiple things per day, whereas in the India office, um, because they're more technical, um, they were spending an entire day just on one task. And so they only had to fill out per day one text field and one notes. So it was taking them a lot less time. So I thought, okay, now I'm gonna focus on the UK office because you can see we have a time issue here. They're spending so much time filling out their timesheets. And this potentially could be why we had so many late time sheet submissions because it takes people so long to fill it out that, yeah. So there's, a, there's, a, there's room here for improvement. And so when I compared people that were filling out their timesheet all in one go. So they're waiting till the end of the week and then filling out their timesheet all in one go and submitting it. Or they were waiting one or two weeks and then filling out two weeks worth of timesheets all in one go and then submitting it. Um, but then there were those who would fill out at the end of the day. So they would get to the end of the day and they would look at what they'd done and they fill out their timesheet, save it, and then do that daily until they get to the end of the week and they submit. So what we found was that people that were doing waiting and filling out their timesheets weekly were taking 24% longer. Tw uh, the, the, the cycle time was increased by 24% for, for, for when I averaged out their um, total cycle time. And so what we found here was actually those people that were waiting till the end of the week and had forgotten what they'd done on the Monday were taking much longer because they had to work out what they had done for the week. Um, and this was really increasing the cycle time um, for timesheet submissions. Um, so going back and looking at the outcomes then, so once we'd finished this analysis, and like I said, it was, it was a very short, small scale project, um, quick RPI, we actually managed to get some significant outcomes from this analysis. So uh, we managed to identify um, a timesheet submission method that would reduce time spent on the process by an average of 24%. So the client, which is a small consultancy, but across a big, a bigger organization, this is a significantly large time-saving technique. 
um, by identifying the most effective way to fill out their timesheets, we were able to drive behavioural change to standardise timesheet submissions to the most practical way possible, which is beneficial for both the employee and the company. By creating a regular and consistent routine of filling out their daily timesheets, we can avoid late submissions and ensure that invoices can be processed as soon as possible, um, reducing the cycle time of the process. So our client, like I said, is a small company and we were able to obtain these results with only a small data set over a very short period of time. Um, scaling an investigation such as this to a larger company would be highly beneficial for the company, saving time and reducing costs. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's an overview of, of the project we did here. I'm gonna pass back to Caitlin um, so she can teach you how to prevent um, transformation initiatives from failing. So over to you, Caitlin. Thanks for that, Molly. Um, so um, I've, we've mentioned this kind of throughout with the theme of, about using both people and data to kind of drive these initiatives. And uh, some of the outcomes that Molly found um, actually when we showed this results to the clients and they they showed their staff you know if you just fill it out daily you're actually saving yourself time then they were much more willing to change their behavior um because they can see that they, they, they can see through the data that it, that it will save them time um, and effort and um, so it really helps to have that that kind of data view to help push um these these um these change initiatives within companies. Um, we find that a lot of the time um, data, so data is great. Um, a lot of senior leadership teams, when you want to put together a business case, um, they love to see data. Um, it, it, helps that, it helps to push through that business case within the company. However, data can be misinterpreted. And if you misinterpret data, you're not showing the real story. And that's where that's why you need the, this combination of both people and data. Um, if you if you find a, if you find something interesting with the data, and um, if you don't put business context to it, uh, you could be misinterpreting what actually you're analysing. And then if you take that um, to the business, um, you make it then get caught out later down the line. So um, having conversations with the people it is just so important. Um, I find throughout throughout these. Um, uh, throughout these kind of projects um, but not only is it important in this in the context of making sure that the interpretations of the data are correct but also because people like to own things and ownership um, defining ownership from the start really helps to drive this through the company and keep your employees engaged so um, when it comes to um, once you've got all of this analysis and you've identified those issues and you start pulling together the improvement initiatives from that. Um, what we tend to do is actually define an owner to the work package or the improvement project. And that owner will then have a team that is ready to help support that initiative and a specific timeline to help push that through. Um, and getting them engaged, not just at the end where they get thrown, okay, you need to improve this. If they're engaged from the start and they've been through this process with you, um, they understand the benefit of actually, you know, um, seeing this uh, specific initiative to fruition, and they're um, much more likely to successfully push through the initiative all the way through to the end to actually deliver that change and then monitor the improvement afterwards. Um, finally, um, it, it, bringing this together into an improvement roadmap. So quite often when we do this pro this, these types of projects, we find that there are, um, we don't just find one issue, we usually find multiple issues, multiple improvement actions. And it's about trying to bring this all together to kind of see the future of the company for that specific end-to-end -end process. Um, this can be done through kind of creating to be processes um, by collating those work packages and actually putting set dates, resources, timelines, benefits, costs to the um, all of these uh, small projects that will create this improvement roadmap that you can then take forward within the company to the end. Um, so that's it from us. I think we've got about 10, 12 minutes left for questions. So I'll hand back over to John. That's great. Great information and great demo as a, as a former consultant myself, I can attest to, you know, I was the one who would do it once a week or 
in some cases once a month sometimes and and it does take a long time to go back and try to figure out exactly what what, what you did that week or that month so uh really appreciate the insights and i'm sure the audience does as well uh if people have any questions or comments now's a great time to submit them or chat them into us and, and we'll be happy to address them um why, why folks uh send in their comments um caitlin or molly you know either either one or both you know maybe you could talk a little bit about the you know, kind of ramp up time on the platform. You know, I've always argued that uh, people that understand data, and in your case, both process and data uh, combined, you know, the, the learning curve is not too steep and you can get up to speed, you know, in days, weeks, you know, it doesn't take months to get up to speed on the platform. Um, you know, has that been your experience? I know, I think this was the first project that you guys used, uh, you know, with, with the platform. So just curious, sort of your, your onboarding and ramp up time. Um, yeah, so I think Molly's probably best to answer that question in terms of, because she was part of the, of the data setup. Um, yeah. So do you mean how, how long did it take me to become familiar with the tool? Yeah, just um, learn, learn the platform, you know, be able to run some basic mining runs, you know, just to, just to start getting value out of the platform. Yeah, well, um, I think it's, it's a very intuitive platform. And I think the, the good thing about it, so in terms of performing the mining runs, it's very, it's very low code. It's just um, adding some filters. So once you have just a brief initial um, overview of the platform, being able to perform mining runs is very straightforward. Um, and actually the great thing about it is, is it's, it's very quick as well. So you can actually, once you've performed a mining run, you can clone that same mining run and run it straight again and just tweak it a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think it's very, very user friendly platform um, and easy to navigate. Um, and then, yeah, so, so once you do those mining runs and get the data and then export it, it's all a very uh, streamlined process. So. Cool. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to get the consultants view on the world because, you know, we're, we're always exposed to different industries and different stakeholders and, and you know, we're, we're also not afraid to share our opinions. So I'm, I'm curious to get your insights on the quality of the data. You know, I tend to argue that you know, we provide a more comprehensive and complete view of the current state, uh, you know, and how work really gets done because it is more data driven. Uh, you know, we avoid a lot of the, you know, natural cognitive biases that people have uh, that can crop up, you know, in interviews and workshops and time motion studies, you know, all the traditional tools that people use, um, you know, because people do want to put their best foot forward and don't want to tell you how, you know, things actually get done sometimes or they don't even know. Um, you know, does, does this sort of more data driven, uh, more uh, accurate view of the truth, you know, does that kind of align with your perspective that you saw with this data or, you know, have I drunk the, the Fortress, uh, Fortress IQ Kool-Aid too much? <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I, I find that you know, data is data. Um, if the data that you, you, what you get out, what you initially set to get out of the system is what you're going to get. Okay. So if you're going to set your scope to pull out X, Y, Z fields and bits of information, then you're going to get that out at the end. Um, now the tool itself is great in terms of it can help you automatically identify automation opportunities and um, it's easily uploaded to Power BI, um, which we find is probably the most common analytical tool um, that we find our clients use. Um, now, I mentioned earlier about misinterpreting data. So um, as long as you understand the data and you know what you've pulled out of the system, um, you can analyze this and you can get some great insights. Now, if, you, if the person who is analyzing this data is not actually aware of the process, doesn't understand the process, doesn't understand the data, um, they're, they're, going to, they're going to kind of get themselves into this analytical black hole where they're, they're trying to analyze something they don't fully understand. And this is where our kind of process centric view really comes in. And um, you need to understand the process in order to analyze it. And just throwing data in front of someone and saying this is the data from the process isn't really going to help them in that. Um, and this is why we kind of did this high level, OK, end to end look at the problem of order to cash um, in this case study. Um, and then we identified specifically within that end to end which section was going to be most beneficial for 
the client. Um, you know, we, we, we saw that the that we saw that it cropped up um, in the analysis that it was going to be the timesheets. And that's where we found, OK, well, we want to mine that data to see what the best process variant is to complete that task. And that's when you then want to bring in a tool like Fortress IQ once you've done that high level analysis to get the, the juicy details and the data out of it. Um, so that you can then um, work out and present the, the, you know, what should be the happy path for that specific process. That's great. And we're starting to bump up against time. I want to give people an opportunity to, uh, if, the, if people do have any follow up that they want to do. Um, Sarah, I think you've got a poll that you can push out to have some, uh, uh, you know, if you have requests any follow up from us, uh, that would be great if you could send that out now. But we've got a couple other questions that come in and we'll, we'll stick around for uh, as long as people have questions. Uh, two that came in from the audience, uh, one technical one that I'll take. Does it work on Mac OS clients or only Windows? Uh, the sensor itself is Windows based, um, but it can capture green screens, virtual machines, you know, all that sort of stuff as well. But not, uh, we don't have a Mac client at this time, mainly because folks haven't asked about it. Um, it's not necessarily a technical issue. Uh, we also got a question, how did the staff react? And this one's for, you know, Molly or Caitlin. Uh, how did the staff react? And I can give my opinion as well. Um, when you said you'll be installing a sensor on the desktop, was anyone worried about, you know, quote unquote, spying? Yeah. Um, so um, we explained the, the we had to explain the tool in detail and actually how it captures the data um, to kind of put people's worries aside in this. So um, you can kind of program the observer to only record sections of the screen that is actually the process. So for example, um, opening up the timesheet application and then pressing save and exit. Once you then press save and exit, it would then close down the observer. So anything that happened before that or after that would not have been recorded um, you know, in, in that session. Um, but when we kind of explained that you can determine that this would only be observing the screens for the section of the process that we're interested in, you know, the other bits of work they've done in the day where they're not fi filling out the timesheets, we, we don't want to know about that, you know, that'd be a lot of data coming in that would just confuse our analysis. Um, so there were some initial worries, I think that's quite common when it comes to downloading an observer. Um, however, once we did explain how the tool actually works, people were, were quite um, happy to, to download it. Um, uh, we did. I don't think we had any objections from memory. Maybe one, um, but it was um, everyone. Every everybody was actually keen to hear about the results, um, and they knew that this would help them in in the long run. So um, yeah, I mean, Molly, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that, but that was my yeah, perspective I, from it. Yeah, definitely. And if you're worried about personal information, you can also. So for example, Teams and things like that, you can program. Um, the, the observer to not capture that information. Um, yeah, so, and I think also like Caitlin was saying, I think a lot of the companies we work with, a lot of the SMEs are quite keen to actually have their issues resolved. So um, I think we've, from my experience, they've always been quite willing to, to participate. Um, but yeah. John, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's the same experience that we see. You know, all, ultimately it comes down to kind of a change management uh, issue and how you communicate that to, to people like, hey, do you want to go sit in a workshop for eight days or do you want to install this on your computer, you know, and just kind of go about your day? And, you know, yes, we have allow and deny lists and other ways to protect, you know, PII and other personal information. Um, and, and also it, in some ways comes down to the culture of the company. You know, we've had some people who just say that this is never going never gonna to fly in our organization. But again, I think in this day and age that we're, we're living in, there's more interest in this type of technology. Um, you know, that, that doesn't come up as much as it did, it did previously. A uh, couple more questions, then we'll wrap it up. Um, this one comes up a lot regarding sort of the differences between process mining and task mining, and do they are they competitive or do they work well together? I'm just sort of curious to get your your insights on this. You know, I've argued that kind of the the traditional process mining, where you go in and you know access log files of applications and do the analysis on that. Um, gives you sort of an, and you touch on this, Molly, that higher level uh, view of the process. Um, 
you know, and then task mining, sort of the, the user interface layer and the, the click by click detail gives you that sort of, you know, level five area. Uh, you know, my argument's always been that, you know, ideally you have both because, you know, the, the, the task mining or the, the process mining can really tell you, you know, what is happening. You know, it's taking this long to process an invoice or it's, you know, it's taking this long to manufacture something. But to get to the why it's happening, you really need that task level detail. Um, is that your experience or do you guys have a different take on it? Yeah, so this is this is a really good question, actually. And um, with our clients, it's, it's propped up quite a few times. Um, we've found that most of the time they complement complement each other really well. Um, but also you can do use them individually. Um, so, for example, um, we with this project, we did look at the high level, but that was just through process interviews and discussing it with um, with the SMEs. We didn't use process mining and um, we found that when we looked at the process and we realized okay timesheets is the problem we didn't need to do process mining that wouldn't have given us any useful insight to that it's a procedure level problem we needed to look you know more into the task mining side of things so for, the, for this, this case we didn't use process mining uh, it wasn't necessary it, we found that it was a procedure level problem so we just went straight to task mining however we have found that for projects where we've done process mining and I actually have quite a good um, example for procure to pay and um, we did a, a, a proof of concept um, for, for process mining and um, we found that there were a lot of uh, freeway match failures happening um, for the procure to pay in the procure to pay process now with process mining we were able to work out um, what was causing the um, the failure in terms of was it a PO was it the goods receipt was it you know quantity cost etc that was being changed now we actually found that recording the goods receipts were being done incorrectly however we didn't know um, you know specifically what was being done incorrectly on those goods receipts so that meant that the, the part of the um, kind of improvement initiative at the back of this was actually do that does this client now look into task mining to analyze how these goods receipts are being recorded to make sure that they're actually being recorded correctly in the system and that is something that process mining would not be able to do because it's that click by click level detail keystroke detail that's required and um, so that's kind of a nice example of where they've done process mining to get a good high level view of the issues but to fully address one of the issues, they did need that task mining perspective. Great, last, <clears throat> last question we've got here. Uh, you know, as, as experts in the discipline of, of business process management, and, and as, as you self-described in the beginning, you know, process nerds, and uh, I'm a big fan of frameworks as well, so I'll, I'll put myself in that category. Um, you know, what do you see as the role of process and operational data in driving uh, successful transformations. You know, most transformation programs struggle. The success rates, you know, south of, of 30% in most studies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they struggle to get off the ground. They don't deliver the expected value. You know, do you think process intelligence really is a potential solution to some of these challenges of transformation? Yeah, so um, what I've seen so far is when we have used data-driven insights, um, they have been much more successful down the line, um, being that when you don't look at mining solutions, um, when you're looking at process improvement, you are basing a lot of your um, improvement actions on just the opinions of people. Now, people are great and um, we and their opinions are, are often very valid. And we found that when we have done mining, we found that, OK, they've identified an issue. We've mined it and we've seen, yes, this is definitely an issue. However, some people find some issues to be more important than others. And in order to understand actually how frequently that issue is occurring, how, you know, does it, um, is it actually a common problem within, within the end-to-end -end process? That's when you do need to get mining involved um, and not, not just to see how common it is, but also to see the actual effects that that issue has on the process itself in terms of, um, you know, in terms of cycle time, cost, resourcing, et cetera. Um, I've, I've done a lot of projects where we haven't used mining and people get caught up on a, a something that they've experienced a lot and they get frustrated with 
and then a company spends a lot of time and resource trying to fix something that actually isn't really going to generate much value to them in the long run. And I think having this um, data perspective kind of clears out the, the hazy, unvaluable, um, uh, you know, improvement initiatives that a business might have otherwise spent a lot of time and money on. Um, so I think it's definitely something that in the future, I think you will see a lot more businesses adopting it and we're seeing it now. Um, it's very rare nowadays we do a transformation project where we don't mine data. Um, they, they, it kind of comes hand in hand and the results are a lot more successful when, when we have data behind it as well as that, in, as well as the insights from people. That's great. Molly, anything to add to that? No, I think Caitlin answered the question beautifully. Thanks, Molly. Right. <laughs> awesome. Well, that, that's great insight. And I think that's a, a great point to end on as well. You know, I've argued that too much emphasis, you know, the past decade with transformation is around technology and people have always sort of seen technology as the answer. And that's really come at the, the expense of the people and, and process dimension. Um, and as, as us consultants are aware, you know, people process technology is really the key to project success, but the, the, the emphasis has been over, over, overly blown on the technology side. And I think that's one of the, the causes for limited success rates, but uh, you know, we, we can tackle that conversation another day. Uh, from all of us at Fortress IQ, thanks very much for joining us today. Hopefully it was informative and you, know, you were able to pull out at least that one piece of knowledge that I promised. Uh, I certainly picked up a few items to add to my talk track uh, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Caitlin Thomas and Molly Bland from BPMD. Uh, they really illustrated how it is critical to understand today to be able to improve tomorrow and how process-led transformation really has the potential to improve the performance and outcomes of your programs. Um, don't let the accents fool you. They are UK-based, but their team is split between London and Philadelphia and India as well. So uh, you know, be, be sure to reach out to them with questions. Uh, as the BPMD folks are real thought leaders in this field. Uh, I think their insight was really spot on around leveraging the, the strengths of Fortress IQ's process intelligence platform. You know, organizations can quickly detail their current state operations, really pinpoint uh, the most uh, optimal areas for improvement and automation, and then accelerate projects uh, that can support just about any key business initiatives. Uh, for more information, please visit our website, connect with us anytime. Uh, we've got our twice a month introduction and live demo webinar tomorrow if anyone's interested. Uh, details are on the events section of our website. Uh, we would love to see you there. So thanks again for joining us today. Stay safe as we kick off the summer season. Hopefully uh, we can all start seeing each other and exchanging ideas in person again real soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day.